When you started writing these kinds of thoughts, um, who were you writing for? Were you writing for yourself? Were you writing knowing that there were people who were just exactly where you were? Who, who was your audience? I think every author writes for himself subconsciously. Uh, I think every preacher preaches to himself subconsciously every Sunday. But I think there are others. Uh, my daughters were were very modern young women growing up, and they were pushing all the boundaries. And one of my daughters has a PhD in physics from Stanford University, and, and she said to me on one occasion, Dad, the questions the church answers are questions we don't even ask anymore. So in some sense, I'm writing for her and for that generation. And what I'm trying to say to them is that the kind of Christianity I grew up with and you grew up with is not going to be adequate for your life. Mm -hmm. And I want to open the possibility that there's a new way to look at Christianity. So I'd say I, I write subconsciously for my daughter, for me, and I write consciously for my daughters and for that generation. I call them in, in one book, I, I call my audience believers in exile. I think they still have enough of the memory of the faith tradition that they yearn to be believers. I find them, them exiled from organized religion and from the way the church organizes its life, and for good reason. That is, the church, the church is still caught in pre-Darwinian, pre-Copernicum categories. Uh, the idea that we were born in sin is a very strange idea when you're past Darwin. You know, the idea that there was an original perfection from which you fell mm -hmm. and had to be redeemed doesn't make a lot of sense if you see life as emerging over 13.8 billion years from the beginning of this universe. And so we've got to begin to lift what I think mm -hmm. is the Christ experience out of the explanations of antiquity mm -hmm. and then find a new way to make that experience live. And I think we do this in other areas of life all mm -hmm. the time, but we don't know how to do this in religion. Yeah. Bishop Spong, I've seen you um, several times from a distance when you were speaking. I've, I've been in meetings with you, and we were, obviously this is the closest we've been. You seem so at peace uh, with yourself, so comfortable with your convictions and the statements that you share with us. Has it always been like that, or have there been some bumps? Uh, I, I, I go myself so many times back to Van Gogh's question, does, does it go uphill all the way? And uh, so ha have there been the real uphill climbs well, for course. you? Uh, if I'm if I'm tranquil now, it's a result of mellowness and old age, <laughs> and the fact that I live in the love of my wonderful wife. Uh, you know, we've had you know I've had sixteen legitimate death threats that I've had to deal with. Uh, I tell people none of them came from an atheist or a Buddhist. They all came from Bible quoting, true believing Christians. Yeah. Christine and I have been spat upon as we walked into buildings where we were going to make an address. I've been ostracized. I've been officially disassociated with by the bishops of my church in a, in a vote after I ordained an openly gay man. But the magnificent thing about that vote is that it was 78 to 74 with two abstentions. And you can hardly <laughs> disassociate yourself from the House of Bishops if the vote is that close. And I was one of the two abstentions because I tell people I didn't know on how to vote on whether I wanted to associate with me or not. <laughs> but the fact is that after that vote, uh, I addressed the House of Bishops for about 45 minutes and, and sort of told them how I had come from being an absolutely homophobic, Bible-quoting kid in Charlotte, North Carolina, to the place where I was willing to put my career on the line for the, for the inclusion of gay and lesbian people. And when I finished that talk, uh, at least 12 bishops came up to my desk and said, if I could have heard that before I voted, I would have changed my vote. At that moment, I knew we had a majority on that issue in the House of Bishops, and that was 1989. Mm. That's a long time ago. That's a long time. Uh, and, and that majority is held. It's never, we've never not had that majority in favor of open inclusion of gay and mm -hmm. lesbian people, and my church has moved rather dramatically, and I'm very, very proud of that. So that... Uh, but you know, it wasn't easy. I remember the night after that vote, and I had two bishops that came out of the closet to me, and both of them were married. 
and one of them had voted to associate with me and the other voted to disassociate with me. And I, I found this conversation really dramatic. Uh, the one who was positive, who, who came to thank me for my vote, was retired, and the other was active. And I asked the second one why he was so duplicitous. And he said, because I'm scared to death. The only way I know to protect my hidden homosexual self is to oppose homosexuality all the time, publicly, and so I do. I told him that I had no respect for that because he cannot be who he is. That's dishonest. Uh, now, both of these people, in fact, all of them, both of them are dead today, and I promised to conceal their identity, and I never will reveal it, but these are very real experiences. And, and I've also known in the House of Bishops people who were just terribly homophobic that turned out to be closeted gay people, and that became revealed before mm -hmm. they died. And I feel sorry for them because I, homosexuality is sort of strange. You can't hide the fact that you're black or white, and you can't hide the fact that you're male or female, although I suppose some transgender people do that. But it's really easy to hide your sexual orientation inside lots of closets. Mm -hmm. And we've had a lot of priests who are homosexual that had a married cover for that, and we've had a lot of bishops who've had a married cover for that. And one of the things that's happening in our world today is that we're forcing honesty into the public arena because we're accepting people honestly and we don't accept those who are dishonest. Right. Uh, so that the pressure now is to come out if you're, if you're gay and it's happening in athletes and it's happening in business executives and it's happening all over the world. Okay. And it's becoming almost commonplace. For gay people to come out of the closet, and if they'd all come out of the closet, it would be a healthier society. Because then it, everybody would say, you? But I like you. There's nothing wrong with you. And so our stereotypes would get broken. Uh, and, they, and they do. One of the things I learned when I was working with my doctor friends at the Cornell Medical Center on this issue was that uh, the number of gay people in the population appears to be pretty stable at all times and all places throughout all countries and all societies. And once you accept the fact that it's just a stable part of who we human beings are, then it's awfully hard to blame dominating mothers or weak fathers or all the other things we used to blame. Because uh, I don't think you can create a homosexual. I don't think you can create one. I don't think you can change one. I was so glad to see Exodus yeah. pass out of existence because it was a fraudulent institution yeah. and, and had been. And, you know, anytime you are going against the best knowledge that we have, I don't know any doctor today who thinks that people choose their yeah. sexual orientation. Yeah. Uh, just don't do it. But Bishop Spong, what, what is it about sex in the church? I mean, I know you've written this, yeah. and I know that we, we, we pay too much attention to uh, Augustine, who seemed as screwed up on it as anybody. That yeah, might could not be, be the right verb to use, but. Uh, <laughs> well, that's true. But it's, uh, he certainly did. Well, the church is a funny institution. It probably knows less about sex than it knows about anything. I mean, some of the stuff we've come out with is really absurd. And the reason that, uh, that sex is at the heart of our identity. You know, I don't think of myself as a human being. I think of myself as a male human being. And I presume my wife thinks of herself as a female human being. But uh, so you're talking about something at the core of our existence, and we're talking about something that I suppose everybody's a little bit ambivalent about. Uh, I don't think you'd have the razor ads and the Marlboro cigarette ads and the macho ads that we have if, if it didn't appeal to men's ambivalence about their own sexuality. And I certainly don't think you'd have the cosmetic industry if there were not a certain ambivalence about women. So that, mm -hmm. that we have these huge uh, enterprises in our society that indicate that people are insecure about their sexuality. And so homosexuality fires the, the anxieties of insecurity pretty deeply. And so what we've done historically is we've tried to repress homosexuality. We've tried to repress not just sexuality, homosexuality. Right. We've tried to repress heterosexual, any kind of sexuality. Yeah. Uh, so the church gives you a definition. It says that if you want to be holy, you're a celibate male. 
That's a strange definition. That violates everything we know about nature and creation. Mm -hmm. And it also, it's pretty obvious that once you repress healthy sexuality, what you get is no, is not no sexuality. You get distorted sexuality. Right. So the church has dealt with all sorts of distortions of its uh, premise, including the child abuse thing, which is a, a yeah. clear it's systemic sickness. Right. What we said about women, you know, we said about women, there's only one ideal woman, and she's a virgin mother. Well, it's really difficult to be a virgin mother. So presumably only one person can pull that out, pull that off. That means that every other woman has to accept the fact that she's less than ideal. Mm -hmm. So we build guilt into the situation. Then we say to women, well, since you can't be ideal, then you take a choice. You either become a virgin and join the nunnery, you become a mother, and that means you can't use any artificial birth control because that would make sex evil. Mm -hmm. So the prohibition against birth control is in that. And, and so a homosexual person uh, just doesn't fit into the category, and, and so we regard that as evil. Yeah. Well, that's just plain crazy. And one of the things that's happening in our world is that, is that education has gotten down into the ranks. You know, in the Middle Ages, the only people educated were the priests. Mm -hmm. Now universal education, and I think the more we educate people, and that's why the fundamentalists fight so hard to keep evolution out of the public schools of Texas, for example. They sure. still battle about that because there's great power in education when people understand what the issues are. Uh, and, 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 you know, you don't want to be on the wrong side. Uh, I don't, I don't debate today with members of the Flat Earth Society. That issue is closed. You know, it's not one that anybody wants to debate. I don't debate yeah. about whether homosexuality is evil or good. It's morally neutral. Yeah. So is heterosexuality. Can you misuse it? Of course. Yeah. Now, people say, but homosexuals do such dreadful things. Well, child abuse and pimping and prostitution and, and that sort of thing are mostly heterosexual proclivities. Yes. Uh, so that, you know, we can use sexuality as a destructive aspect of our personalities in any direction we want, mm -hmm. but it's, uh, it doesn't mean that the sexuality itself, and that's a strange argument. Alcohol has many positive features. It also can be very destructive. Drugs save lives, but drugs can destroy lives. It's in yeah. the matter of the way they're used. And I think part of what the Christian church has got to do is to help people accept what they are and then find a way to live it out with dignity and holiness and integrity yeah. instead of saying, well, you can't be that uh, because that's unacceptable yeah. to us. Who is a Christian? I mean, you talk about the fact of what happened in uh, among your colleagues in, in the bishop, among the bishops. Um, we're hearing conversations now coming against the backdrop of the, the tragedy in Boston. But who is a Muslim? Uh, who decides that? Uh, so who is a Christian? Well, basically it would be a follower of Jesus. But let's understand that religion exercises great psychological force in human people and human beings' lives. Every human being I know looks for some kind of security. And one of the places you look for it is in religion. And if religion is going to give you security, then it's got to be the correct religion. That's why the Pope has to be infallible. That's why the Bible has to be inerrant. That's why you have to say, my religion is the only true religion. My church is the only true church. I control the access to God. Nobody comes to the Father but by me. All of those are the arguments that come out of human insecurity. Now, you know that every one of us, you can take any religion and you can find people who live out some of its highest principles, like Mahatma Gandhi, and you can find out people who live out its most basic prejudices and fears. Mm -hmm. We have religious wars, we have the Inquisition, we have religious persecution. Uh, the Crusades in the 11th, 12th, and 13th century were mounted primarily by the Vatican to go to the Holy Land to destroy infidels. It's not very different from those 19 guys armed with box cutters that took over planes and came to kill the infidels in this country. The motivation is not dissimilar. Mm -hmm. uh, but the object, you know, one was on the... The only good thing I should see about 9-11 is that it forced the West to see what we have done to other religions in the name of our God because we were on the receiving end, and that's a dreadful way to learn a lesson. And it's particularly devastating in this area because every one of us knew someone who was killed in the 
World Trade Center. And this, and of course, they all worked and lived around here. We had lots of funerals around here yeah. during that period of time. So it was a devastating experience. But every experience forces you to learn something. And one of the things we're learning is that the world is very, very small and that you've got to learn to live with and cooperate with people who share different values. That's why in the metropolitan areas of the United States, we're more liberal than we are in the more rural areas. And I think those words are the wrong words. I don't think liberal and conservative is what we ought to use. I think we ought to use open and closed. You have to be, if you live in a metropolitan New York area, you've got to be respectful of a wide variety of differences. If you live in a rural community where you by and large see people who look just like you all the time and you spend most of your time washing each other's intellectual underwear and you never hear a different idea and so you assume everybody believes the way you believe and and so anybody who wants to change that becomes evil. Uh, so you have all sorts of things going on. But see, I think the purpose of Christianity and maybe of all religion, but I can't speak for that, the purpose of Christianity is not to give us security it's to give us the courage to embrace the radical insecurity of life with integrity and to keep walking forward. And that's very different. I don't want the peace of God that passeth Equinil or Prozac. I want something that gives me the courage to live in a terribly insecure and frantic world and to live with integrity and to recognize that I can't always change it. I mean, if the rivers are rising, my prayers aren't going to stop the rivers from rising. If the mm -hmm. hurricane is on the way, Hurricane Sandy in this area in particular, yeah. if it's on the way, you just sit and absorb it. And, and the idea that we can somehow change or manage our world with our religion becomes an idolatry. Uh, but I don't think that's what the Christian faith is all about. If you look at the Bible, the images of Christianity were never majority images. The idea that we're supposed to set the pattern and rule the world. The images are you're the salt in the soup. You give the soup its flavor. You're the leaven in the loaf. You give the loaf its capacity to rise. You're the light in the darkness. And I think that by learning to be the minority presence in the midst of life, we would begin to exercise our Christian vocation a lot more deeply than if we try to impose. When, when a, one church wants to impose its view of sexuality on the whole society through law, uh, it immediately gets resisted, and that's not the way we're going to operate in this country. And it, it's a, it can be a really tense fight uh, to watch the Roman Catholic Church and women go at it over health care is an interesting thing because it's good to be Roman Catholic. It's good to be women. You've got two good things colliding, but they're colliding because they've got a different understanding of what their responsibility is. I would never want a Roman Catholic to violate their conscience. I would also never want them to impose their understanding of reality on the body politic. That's what the separation of church and state is all about. And wars have been fought over those issues. And if you're going to be a part of this society, you have to live with some compromises. Uh, that's just the way life goes. And isn't that a, a, a basic principle to rec be recognized by those who seem to want to use uh, political power as a, a tool to leverage a kind of what they see as a Christian nation? That's right. Well, we've got that going on in our nation today. We, what, if you look at American history, what we have going on today in the Tea Party is not unlike the Know Nothing Party that came about in the middle of the 19th century. Mm -hmm. and always comes out in great periods of stress and transition. Now, the fact is that in this country, power is being taken away from the white male establishment. And that's been going on for a long time. Mm -hmm. When this country was formed, only white males who owned land could vote. And I say only white males because they were the only people that owned land. Women couldn't own property in many right. states of the United States. And so what's happened to this country is that the power of white males to run the country and the economy has been broadened to the place they can't quite control it anymore. In the last election, was devastating to that group of people because George, you know, not George, Mitt Romney yeah. won the majority of the white male votes, right. but he lost big among women, he lost big among blacks, he lost big among Latinos, he lost big among people under 40. You know, only white males over 40, and that's not enough. And if you look at the, at the demographics of this country, that vote is just going to keep going in that direction. 
uh, you know, the great fear of the right wing today is not only that they've got an African-American in the White House, but they've got a woman standing in the wings ready to be eight more years. That's devastating uh, for them. Yeah. And, and so, you know, that, that's why you get gridlock in this country, and that's why you get this, all this uh, terrible uh, political uh, confrontation that never lasts, never gets anything accomplished. Uh, but but anyway, I see this as a birth pangs of a new consciousness. I'm not worried about it. Uh, you can't you can't buck consciousness. And what what I think people need to recognize is that in every election, every four years when we elect a president, eight years has gone by in terms of our voting blocks, because every four years, four years of people have died and four years of people have come of age. So in Obama's eight years in the White House, you're going to have 16 years of a change in the voting body politic. And if if Hillary is the president for the next eight years, and that's highly speculative, she you know, she could be deceased by the time, you know, that's not, not good to speculate more than about a week in advance in politics. But that would mean 16 more years. That'd be 32 years. That means it's never going to be the same. Yeah. And yeah. and when people see power slipping away, they they're frantic. But what we've done in this country is that we first allowed white males to vote who didn't own property, then we allowed black males black males to vote. Uh, we kept, tried to keep it down with poll taxes and a lot of other things, intimidation. But they could still legally vote. And then in 1920, we let women vote. There was great enormous fear about that. Women thought that the uh, the men thought women would, were too f emotional to be rational. That was the big argument. They might choose the wrong president. Well, they, they 72 years later, they did choose the wrong president, uh, 76 years later. Yeah. The women's vote finally elected a president in 1996. Without the women's vote, Bill Clinton would not have had a second term, and Bob Doe would have been the president of the United States. It's In 2012, it was even broader because the the vote that gave Obama, I think, a 53 percent of the of the popular vote was made up of people under 40, women, blacks, Latinos. And those numbers are growing. They're not going to decline. Those numbers are growing. Yeah. You see, we allowed college kids to vote. Uh, we amended the, or passed the law that allowed that lowered the age to 18. Mm -hmm. One of the big fears going on in the immigration vote, one of the reasons why it's so hysterical is that if the immigration bill that is now proposed by the Gang of Eight, as they say it, if it's passed, no matter how long it takes, what it does is put 11 million illegal immigrants onto the voting rolls as legal citizens, and they're mostly going to vote Democratic right. until they get rich enough. People, I used, to say to, <laughs> I used to say to people in the South who would be always worried about the block vote, black vote was always a block vote for the Democrats, why shouldn't it be? I mean, if you if you let the black population get on board the economy of this country and become wealthy, they'll vote Republican. Uh, <laughs> you let women get the vote and they become presidents of Hewlett Packard or they become presidents of eBay, they're going to vote Republican. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know why they're so afraid. If you just let the process go. Uh, young people turn conservative as they get older. That's a, <laughs> I don't know where the fear is. It, they just can't live through the crisis because it's so. It says I'm losing power.